I, I'm going to uh, I don't know what I'm going to, I'm trying something today um, that I've never done before. <laughs> we are entering into kind of a period of American history where politics is starting to get a little modern. And because politics is starting to get modern, it's starting to kind of um, get its modern terminology. And this is a good lecture, not only for American history, but as you become citizens of near voting age, um, you want to know um, what a liberal is, and what a conservative is, and you know what a radical is, and kind of why they believe what they believe, what they do. That there's a lot of confusion out there that most people um, don't know, quite frankly, and. Um, even people who say, oh, I'm such and such, I'm a real, you know, staunch conservative. Um, there was a poll that came out, you know, not that long ago, that, you know, 20% of, of self-proclaimed conservatives believed things that were not conservative. And that's nothing wrong with what they believe, is they didn't have the label right. Um, and labels are important. Labels help us, you know, at a quick glance determine, you know, when someone says, oh, such and such is a liberal, such and such is a radical, such and such is a conservative, we really ought to know what those labels mean. Like Obama is a liberal, but then, like, one of his best friends that's in the Senate is a conservative, and they kind of always fight on it. I remember he, um, there was a guy that just got, that got, that left because he had, like, a brain tumor or something. Uh, you know his name? I don't know. A senator that had a brain tumor? Yeah, no, no. Like he got like an he got like cancer. Ted Kennedy several years ago died of brain cancer. That was like in two thousand. No, he, had, he left Congress. Like I remember seeing it in the news. Like the week that since Obama was a liberal, but he had like a very good friend that was a conservative, and they both went into the Senate at the same time. Right. Coburn. And Coburn. Tom Coburn. Yeah. No, I mean, I would think they might have been like, first, they certainly weren't political allies. Oh, of course not. Right, right. No, but we're, yeah, I mean, great, sure, but like we're... And no, no, I was just saying how they always, even though they were friends, they always fought on the... Well, of course, because they're, they have political differences. Yeah, Tom, um, obviously. Yeah. She was Tom Colbert. Tom Colbert. Instead of kind of going like issue by issue, which, and issues change, what we're going to try to do is discuss a couple of kind of fundamental questions and how both sides of kind of the, the political spectrum answer those questions and then foundationally what makes a person a conservative or a radical or a liberal or something like that. So um, we're going to go fairly quickly. We're not going to be having debates, you know, over it. Um, one thing that I do want to kind of put out there with this is the fact that, you know, too often in our politics today, you know, we look at someone who disagrees with us and we immediately paint them, they're stupid, they're evil, they're racists, they're this, they're that, they're the other thing, just because they disagree with what we happen to believe. And one of the points that I'm going to try to be making today is that both sides of the spectrum here have very strong beliefs that are rooted in philosophy and reality. Um, and we should not ever simply dismiss them, oh, he's a liberal, that means he's a moron, he's a conservative, that means he's a racist, um, because that's not the case. Um, and we should always remember that even if we are disagreeing with someone, in all likelihood, if they have thought out why they believe what they believe, there is a foundation to that belief that they happen to have. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is something that we've already touched on in this class. Um, the question is, which is more important, negative liberty or positive liberty? Now, a couple other things. One is I'm going to try very hard to not let you know what I think. Um, I don't think it's important that you know what I happen to believe. It's, I don't like teachers, quite frankly, that do that. Um, I hope you have no idea what I think about these questions. Um, when we are done with this lecture. 
I'm also not going to label um, the sides kind of until we're done. Because um, I don't want you guys to say, oh, I, I know I'm a liberal, and that means I believe all the things that are going to be in this column or another. Which is more important, positive liberty or negative liberty? So before we get to that is what is positive liberty and what is negative liberty? Who remembers? This is something that we have talked about um, before we were talking about the Articles and the Constitution and things like that. What is negative liberty? <laughs> it's not negative in the connotation that it's bad. And it's not positive in the connotation that it's good. So it's not a value judgment. What is negative liberty? Against the people? The Bill of Rights is a document of negative liberty. Well, who's they? Very good. Negative liberty is the liberty to be left alone. The Bill of Rights is a document of negative liberty. It's a document of things government cannot do to you. It cannot infringe on your freedom of speech. It cannot infringe on the exercise of your religion. It cannot infringe on your right to bear arms. It cannot, you know, try you twice for the same crime. It cannot, you know, put you through cruel and unusual punishments. List, 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 list. The idea behind negative liberty is that the more liberty you have, the better. And you have more liberty if government can do less to stuff to you. It's like carrying around a big ball of liberty, and government, whenever government makes a rule, it chips away a little bit at that big ball of liberty. Now, even a person who believes in negative liberty is going to, there is some function for government. You know, government has to, you know, um, guarantee contracts, provide for the defense of the country. Um, but by and large, negative liberty is a belief that the government that governs least, governs best. Okay? You should have a right to wear your seatbelt or not wear a bike helmet or not. Every time government does something and spends money to do it, government is taking money out of your pocket and giving it to somebody else. Negative liberty. The belief that I just want to be left alone. I don't want government telling me that I need to pay these high taxes. I don't want government telling me I need to do this, that, or the other thing. Leave me and my family and my community alone. Positive liberty. Okay, what are some negative liberty rights? Let's before we jump over. We kind of just listed a bunch of them. What are some ne rights of negative liberty? Yeah, government, that I, the government cannot interfere with my right to, to bear arms. What else? Negative liberty. Right to speech. Right to associate. Right to what? Right to assemble. My right to publish in the press. All of these, these are negative rights. Rights that are not dependent on what? If you think about them, what are they not at all dependent on? The government. My right to bear arms, my right to speak. What is it my right to attack the government? What are they not dependent on? Other people. Other people. Very good. That for me, my, my freedom of speech is not dependent on any other human beings. Right? If I so desire, I can stand up on a box, you know, in the middle of the street and yell and scream strange things all day long. Can I not? Sure. That's not dependent on anybody else. You know, my right to, you know, publish a newspaper is not dependent on it. If I want to, you know, write out broadsheets in my basement and hand them out to passers-by, that's not dependent on anybody else. Thank you, Carl. Now, positive liberty 
is basically the belief that government's job is to help this marker stinks. And it's new. And it's bounced out of the door. Okay. Positive liberty. The idea behind this is that it's government's job to help citizens fulfill their lives and potential. That a person who advocates for positive liberty would say that if Sebastian is homeless and starving, it really doesn't matter that he has freedom of speech and freedom of association. He needs food and shelter. And therefore, it is government's responsibility to make sure that Estev has food and shelter. That's positive liberty. Okay? Government's job is to help citizens fulfill their lives and fulfill their potential. Now, of course, what is the only way that government can make sure that Estev has food and shelter? It has to invade your It has to invade your liberty. It has to say, Tiani has a comfortable life. Government is going to reach into Tiani's pocket, take some money out, and give it to Estiff. Because is that what? It, what do we now? We might. What, what is that called? Taxes. That's called taxation. Government says Estiff needs. Tiani has. Yoink. Yoink. What are some positive liberty rights? Think about rights that involve you fulfilling your lives and your potential. We put, you know, you have a right to X. Education, excellent. Education is a positive right. When Elizabeth Public Schools runs itself for a year, it costs like $300 million. Where does that $300 million come from? Taxpayers. Taxpayers, mostly in the state of New Jersey. We have determined as a country that it is worth picking Keani's pocket enough to fund public education. But is that an imposition on her liberty? Yeah, yeah it, it is. What else is a positive right? Obamacare. I have a right to health care. <laughs> I have a right to a job. I have a right to a house, etc., etc. Now, what makes these rights different from these on other people? That if I say that Estiff has a right to health care, what am I assuming exists? I need a doctor. Doctors. Doctors. Isn't that a pretty fundamental statement that if I say Estiff has a right to health care, by definition, that is dependent on the fact that there are doctors, right? Yeah. If, I, if all of a sudden all the doctors disappeared from the earth, <laughs> would Estiff's right to health care be worth it? He might, he might still say he has it, but he can't do anything with it. Do you see how that's different from the right to free speech? If all the doctors in the world disappeared, Estiff's right to free speech would be completely the same. But his right to health care would be different. If we say that Estiff has a right to a job, we're implying what? That there are people willing to hire him. We are implying that Estiv has enough value that it makes it worth someone's while to hire him. So this is positive liberty. Negative liberty. Okay? One of the things I really hope you do in the course of this 
lecture is start thinking about maybe where you happen to fall. You know, do you, do you think that liberty is being left alone to live your life by the government? Or do you think that liberty is making sure that government is there to help you succeed in life? <clears throat> Which is better, central, central government control or local government control? A person who believes in central government control believes that it is best for one standard in the country. And we can think of a lot of different examples. Should um, should there be one standard for abortion laws in the United States? A person who believes in centralized control says yes. Whether it doesn't matter pro or con, a person with who believes in kind of central control says the rules for everyone in the country should be one one rule. Whether you live in West Virginia, Florida, or Washington. The rule is the same. Is should um, should same-sex marriage be have one rule for it, not all different rules depending on your state? Should states be allowed to have different levels of income tax? Should states be allowed to have different rules for how people get their driver's licenses? Should states have different rules for? Um, what qualifies you for a high school diploma? Like in New York, do you know what you have to do to get a high school diploma? You have to take and pass the Regents exam. You don't pass if you don't take and pass the Regents. You, it's a subject test at the at you take senior year. You take an English Regents. You take a Math Regents. And it's a. Um, we need more time to put them up. Okay. So we need to pass. pass. No, no, no. Go to class. Go to class. Go to class. Okay. And find someone in DI who has seventh grade lunch. Okay, then. Okay. All right. The, the rules for passing high school in New Jersey are different from the high school rules for passing high school in New York. What you study, that curricula in each state, are somewhat different. Do you believe that fourth graders in fourth graders in Oklahoma should be learning the exact same thing as fourth graders in New Jersey. If you believe that, then you are a central lizer. That you believe that decisions, decisions should be made in Washington, D.C. Decisions made in D.C. for everybody. Now, on the other hand, Advocates of local control, which say that states and localities are different, and that government should reflect that. That an advocate for this would say abortion laws should be different in different states because different states are different. That a very liberal state would have one set of abortion laws, a very conservative state would have another set of abortion laws. Some states are fine with same-sex marriage, some states are not, and that's fine. Um, some states will have a high personal state income tax, some states will have zero personal income tax. There's quite a few states with no state income tax. 
There's, so there's a, they don't, they there's, don't a, there's a federal income tax. Everyone in the country pays a federal income tax beyond the company. And many states also add a state income tax on that. that. Uh, yes. Uh, New Hampshire does not have a state income tax. Florida does not have a state income tax. Wait, I'm sorry. So if you live in Florida, you can't, if you pay taxes, you don't get the tax? No, 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 no. You still pay federal taxes. You just, there's just no state income tax in Florida. And that's why that people move down here. Right, exactly. Because it's cheaper to live. You don't have to pay 7, 8, 9% of your income in a state income tax. Okay? New Jersey is like 4 or 5%. Uh, New Hampshire is zero. Um, you know, Massachusetts and New York is almost 10. California is always about 11. Um, this is. So, now, some criticisms, there's criticisms of both. People who are centralizers would say, look, should Alabama be allowed to discriminate against black people? We say no. But the only way that Alabama is going to stop doing that is if we have one standard. Centralizers might argue it's a lot easier to make 50 smaller governments corrupt than it is to make one big government corrupt. The argument on the other side goes, states are different. You have to recognize that. Um, if every state had the same income tax, you couldn't escape that income tax by moving to a different state. States couldn't compete with each other for businesses. Um, so those are some arguments. Um, how? Is it easier to change laws at the local level or at the federal level? Local level. That every single representative in Washington represents hundreds of thousands of Americans. What's the chance that your individual voice can be heard you know, by just one representative out of 435? But if decisions are made locally, it's a lot easier to get to know and to influence your state legislator or your local legislator there is to, uh, to advocate to and influence your federal legislator. It's an argument for local control. Okay. Does the free market work for whom? What is a free market? Let's start. This is a really, really important concept. Take a few minutes. What is a free market? What's a free market? Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, what do you like to get? 
Yeah. Harley gets an Oreo culotta from Dunkin' Donuts. Why does Dunkin' Donuts offer so many dozens of different drinks and treat options? Because people have different, people have different tastes. So like... Because Dunkin' Donuts' goal is to what? Yeah, for everybody to come to Dunkin' Donuts. Starbucks' goal is for everybody to go to Starbucks. McDonald's' goal is to put it for as many people as possible to go for their coffee at McDonald's. Who determines how much Dunkin' Donuts charges for their Oreo culotta? Dunkin' Donuts. How do they determine how much to charge for their Oreo culotta? Um, how much they have to spend to make it and how much profit they profit without like, overpricing it. Why can't you overprice it? Because there's other people are gonna, they're gonna like, they're gonna have lower. Other companies are gonna have lower prices, and then they're gonna go to them. Why does Why does Dunkin' Donuts make Oreo culottes for Carmen anyway? Do they love Carmen? No. They love the money. They want the people. Yeah, they want. They they love her money. They don't give a crap about Carmen. I mean, they obviously want Carmen to be happy, so she keeps going to Dunkin' Donuts. But they don't care about Carmen. They want, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Because Dunkin' Donuts every day, in its relationship with Carmen, makes a decision. Carmen says, mm, I'm really hungry. I would really like an Oreo culotta. And the little thing on Dunkin' Donuts says Oreo culotta, $3.19. And Carmen says, me eating that Oreo culotta is worth more than what? $3.19. Dunkin' Donuts says Carmen's $3.19 is worth more than my Oreo culotta. And therefore, they do what? They make a trade. Dunkin' Donuts says this is worth less than $3.19. Carmen says, no, this is worth more than $3.19, and she hands over her trade. It's fundamentally the same thing as Carmen, as a person handing over a chicken in exchange for, you know, a barrel of apples back, you know, in Bronze Age times. That a free person goes to a free company and freely decides to spend Money. Hey, Carmen, what's the most you would spend for an Oreo club? You are really hungry one morning. You were up late doing Mr. Solo's history work. Five bucks. Carmen, on occasion, is kind of mentally saying, I would keep paying for this culotta even at more than 319. So for Carmen, 319 is a good deal. Now, what would happen if Dunkin' Donuts said, Oreo culotta is $20? <laughs> Where's Carmen going to go? Somewhere else. He's going to go to Starbucks or McDonald's or to the local corner store, wherever. That is what we mean by a free market. That businesses and property owners are driven by a desire to make a profit. They are not driven by a desire to make the world a better place. But here's the funny thing. In so doing, they end up making the world a better place. And that's kind of the funny thing about a free market. Because I'm going to submit something to you. Every single one of you sitting here in front of me, materially, is so much richer than any medieval emperor. You live a material life of incredible wealth. Think back, and not that you can think, but Elizabeth in 1980. Let's just talk about the standard of living of Elizabeth 35 years ago. When I was around when I was born. Now, you don't have to answer me, but I want you to think. How many of you have air conditioning in your house? Most of you. Elizabeth, 1980, air conditioning is a luxury. How many of you have a clothes dryer? Most of you. 
Some of us may be still hanging out our laundry online. How many of your parents own at least? How many of your parents own at least one car? You go back to Elizabeth 35 years ago, and car ownership maybe 50 or 60 percent. We're not even going to get into Elizabeth 1980. Nobody owned a microwave. That's necessary. Obviously, it's not. People live for a very long time without microwaves. No. Microwave meals. And we're not even talking about shh, your computing and communication technology that has changed in the last 35 years. And we're definitely not even talking about girls and some guys too, I'm sure. The fascinatingly huge amount of shoes, pants, shirts that you own in your closets. Max, a week and a half. <laughs> you are... <laughs> My point is, the free market has made you fabulously wealthy. And that's, I mean, Elizabeth, no one here is... I mean, I bet many of you, when you turn 17, 18 years old, will get your own car. That's... That's many of you, not all of you, but many of you. You insurance is too high. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about a free market. Some people in a free market do really, really well. And some people in a free market don't. Even if Zanady gets a car when she turns 17. In all likelihood, Zanady's going to get, you know, a used Honda. Okay? Don't get a Honda. <laughs> Zanady's peer living in Summit or Westfield, when they turn 18, they get a brand new BMW. You know you're teaching in a rich district when the kids' cars in the parking lot are nicer than the teachers' cars in the parking lot. There are kids here with nicer cars than I have. The criticism of a free market, that a free market leads to inequality. Some people are rich, and some people are poor. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. That's the criticism of a free market. The support of a free market is everyone's standard of living goes up. It might not go up the same amount, but everybody is pretty much better off in 2015 than they were in 1980. Some people are more better off, but everybody is somewhat better off, at least. And they said that's worth the inequality that comes with it. Some people, that a person over here, a person who defends the free market, is going to say, look, if Zanady is hardworking and smart enough and talented enough to produce a product that everybody wants, she ought to be rich. If somebody is smart enough and talented and dedicated enough to become a doctor, they should be rich. We should pay doctors more than we pay, you know, post office mail carriers. And there's an acceptance of inequality here. That's the price you pay for this prosperity that we have. Which is more important, equality of opportunity or equality of outcome? Should we, for example, have a form of action? Should colleges 
say we are going to accept, you know, this number of this group of people and this number of that group of people to guarantee that people who have traditionally been discriminated against have opportunities. We are trying to advocate for equality of outcome. We want 10% that black people in the United States make up 12% of the population. 12% of college graduates should be black. Hispanics in the United States make up 13% of the population, maybe 13 and a half, 14 these days. Should 14% of college graduates be Hispanic? Should 13% of CEOs be black? This is equality of outcome. Should half of representatives be women? They're half the population. Why aren't they half the representatives? That is equality of outcome. Equality of opportunity says give everybody the same opportunity, everybody can apply to Yale. And someone who believes in equality of opportunity would say you shouldn't be allowed to put your name, your race, your gender, or anything on your application. Send it to Yale, they'll pick the best 3,000 people, and that's who gets it to Yale. That's equality of opportunity. Point is, we can make a good argument on both sides of that. And all of these, we can make a good argument on both sides. That's kind of one of the points I'm trying to make here. We can make a good argument for I. This is what this is what politics is about. People disagree. You know, Ryan says just put everyone's name in a hat and go. You know, Sebastian says black people in the United States have been discriminated against for 300 years. Like, they, why should? Why should we expect them to be able to compete exactly the same as people who have had the privilege of not being black in the United States? But then that's not an opportunity. I'm not arguing with you over it. My point is how you would be arguing against. You don't have to debate me on it, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. But my point is there are arguments on both sides of this, okay? Should we be aiming for equal outcomes? Or should we be aiming for equal opportunities? Okay. Huh? This one I like. This one's a little tricky. Which is a better guide for society? Reason or experience? I guess another way to ask this question is how powerful is reason? And how powerful Alright. And this is the example that I'm going to use. People have been saying, hey, what's up? Uh, is Alexis or Taisha here? You know that? I've never heard of this person. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's two different names she yeah. said? Oh, I thought she, it, I thought it was Alexis and then it was a last name. Frick crap. school lunches. And this has happened in the last several years. 
school lunches have changed. Someone, a bunch of very smart people with PhDs next to their names and MDs next to their names all got together in a big room and said, we put our minds to work. Passed a law, all these different things, different rules about fundraisers, different rules about, you know, bake sales, different rules about the food that the cafeteria serves. And they said something, I don't know exactly what the number is, but school lunch has to be like 900 calories or fewer, or something, I don't know, 700, 900, I don't know. Let's say 700. Maybe a lot more than that. It's a number, we call it X, it doesn't matter. And out into a nation of 320 million went this room. And school lunches were filled up with, you know, more veggies and more fruits and whole grains and all the things that are supposed to be good for you. And what did people start to do? <laughs> they started to buy school lunch less. They started the, the, the amount of. Do you know? You ever pay attention to how much? <laughs> do you ever what? Have you ever paid attention to how much food gets thrown out in the lunchroom every day? Yeah. It's almost a sin. Yeah. It really is almost a sin. Because it's so you, 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 we are throwing away so much because somebody said, some very smart, reasonable person said, thou shalt eat this. And, you know, Paul looked at it and said, I don't feel like eating that. <laughs> throws it away, <coughs> and maybe takes the money that she would have spent on school lunch and goes to the corner store and buys burritos. It's even worse. Another problem crops up. You know, here's Karime. Karime is tiny. <laughs> she is. It's not a value judgment. Karime obviously needs fewer calories, you know, than Kevin. What? Yeah, yeah. Of course she does. Kevin's six feet tall. No, no, not He's about 5'11". You're all as tall as I am. Yeah, no. six feet tall. Do they want proof like that? I'm waiting to Kevin. Maybe because eyes are higher on the table. Yeah, I guess. Sit down. Mister. Because I'm six feet tall, I got to get two on you at least. No. I have a long neck. Ryan, do you see my neck? Why are you looking at your neck? Because everybody always uses the shoulder thing and it's like, no, I just have a very like eye thing. No, and the eye thing doesn't work either, because what about people with big foreheads? It's all about the, the top of your head. Obviously. You know, if, you have, like, if you shave your head, you're going like, uh, yeah, to... Uh, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that is true. That is true. <laughs> Two inches. Anyway. Anyway. No. To make the point on a more... To make the point on a more extreme level, imagine the difference between Karime and the 6'6", six 300-pound six, offensive tackle that takes place on a football team. Those two people, under our law here, are going to be eating the exact same lunch. Is that reasonable? No. Okay, so then maybe someone says, okay, we'll fix the law. We'll say, if you're an athlete, you could have more. Okay, what about wrestlers? Well, what if you're a wrestler or a swimmer versus the football player? All right, well, now we'll change the law again. Different sports will have different amounts. Well, what if you're diabetic? What if you are the offensive tackle on the football team versus the punter <laughs> on the football team? We, those are very different body types. Or you're trying to go up and wait instead of trying to cut weight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, cut weight. this is my point. My, the argument against how powerful is reason to kind of to be a guide for society, this law just got real complicated real fast. And now try to imagine, try to imagine enforcing that law 
on a nation of 320 million. It's going to be a nightmare. That is an argument that, look, really smart people with lots of you know, letters and degrees after their name are very often unable to legislate for a huge, diverse nation such as ours. It's better, they would argue, to say, if you're going to do it, leave it up to the local governments, or better yet, just let experience people decide whatever they, they're going to eat for lunch, whatever the hell they want to eat for lunch. Now let's look at it from a different perspective. Okay, so it goes back to like um, negative liberty. It goes back to negative. Yeah, they're all interrelated. Local control, central control, positive liberty, negative liberty. Govern so negative liberty would say, if I want to go to frickin' McDonald's seven times a week and haul my fat ass to Burger King every day, <laughs> I have every God-given right in the world to do that. Hallelujah. Positive liberty would say, no, 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 you are you're going to kill yourself slowly by doing that, and then when you have a heart attack, you know, your Medicare, which is paid for by the government, is going to have to, you know, do a bypass on your sorry ass. Uh, the alternate argument to that point. So is reason, is reason a good guide for lots of little things in society? One side will say that experience is a better teacher. One side will say that no, we are endowed with reason. We can think our way out of these problems. An argument in favor of reason over experience might be same-sex marriage, for example. Society has changed. We are more accepting of homosexuals in 2015. <laughs> Mar marriage has changed over time. A hundred years ago, marriage was only like it was it was necessary as an economic arrangement because women didn't work and to have babies. Marriage has changed in 2015. People don't get married for economic arrangements, and a lot of people who are married choose not to have children. So why shouldn't we? change the definition of who's allowed to get married. That we should not necessarily listen to experience and instead apply reason to say the institution is different, society is different than it was a hundred years ago, and therefore our institutions should reflect that difference. So again, we can make arguments on both sides of this. What were you saying? Oh, uh, yeah, there's only 15 states left that don't have gay marriage. 15? Which one was the first? Vermont? Texas. Yeah. Might be Vermont. No, Vermont. No, Vermont had. Vermont was one of the first, I think, to, to allow. Texas is one of the few that's going. Don't say it. New Jersey does. Yeah. You know, Ray. You know, like, Mario. It's good for All right. Last one before we kind of make our chart go this way. Where do morals and values come from in a society? I can kind of think of two different answers. Your home. Experience. And culture. Uh, and where do morals and values come from culturally? Your home. Where do they come from from your home? Community. Yeah. Based where? Location. Location. Oh. Uh, local. Religion. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, really. Those are the kind of terms. That morals and values come from religion. On the other side, you have the argument that we all get to create our own system of moral beliefs. So. You know, detached from you know what God or the priest or the church says. 
this argues, the counter argument to that is, look, as, we've, as, as society has moved farther away from this, over the last 60, 70 years, American morals and values in a lot of ways have gone into in a lot of ways have gone down. The counter argument back to that is this is kind of exclusionary, and if you don't follow what the community wants, they you know kind of shun you and kick you out, and that's no way to live your life. Good arguments again on both sides. Is it better? That you know, we that we we delay sex until marriage and get rid of all the heartache that comes with you know relationships gone bad due to weird sexual stuff and children born outside of wedlock and teen pregnancy and those things are not good things statistically. So maybe this is better, but you know this you know if you kind of violated the norms of the community here, you weren't welcome in the community here. Um, so again. A change, a difference at least. So, I think this is a pretty good description of modern American politics. A modern American who believes, shh, let's kind of review, and then we'll name them, in negative liberty, that smaller government that is better government, more local control is better than federal control. That free markets are good and they help people become prosperous even though they get prosperous unequally. We support equality of opportunity over outcome. Reason is highly limited and that our morals and values come from God and religion. And if you happen to believe many or most of these things, that makes you an American conservative. A person who believes that it's government's job to do the best it can for every citizen and that centralized authority is best, centralized authority based on the, the rules of you know, smart people writing smart laws using their reason, regulating the market to make sure that inequality is not too bad, and that personal autonomy trumps you know, religious beliefs, that what Kevin believes if it's good enough for Kevin and it doesn't hurt anybody, go with it. This will make you a liberal. Talk about here 
is government ownership of industry. In a free market, okay, let's kind of look at this. A free market, conservative, liberal, socialist. <laughs> A conservative, when it comes to the free market, believes in what's known as laissez-faire, by and large. Laissez-faire is a French word that means let them be, let them do. Government, remember, oh, negative liberty, government that governs best, governs least. A conservative is on the side. In most situations, government should stay out of the economy. That all government does in an economy is screw it up. I'll give you a decent example of that. Let's say government decided one day, you know, gas prices are too high. And we're going to say nobody can sell gas for more than $1.50 a gallon. That is a price cap. You put a price cap of $1.50 a gallon on gasoline. What's going to happen? Economically. What's going to happen if you put a price cap on gasoline and you cannot sell gasoline for more than $1.50 a gallon, but it costs a gas company $1.75 to produce a gallon of gas? Let's say you're the owner of the gas station, Esteve, okay? Esteve owns the Exxon station down the road. Every time a gallon of gas gets pumped into Esteve's store, it costs him $1.75. And now the government says you cannot sell that gas for more than a dollar fifty. What are you going to do? I'm sorry. You're going to happily every single day at the gas station. What? What are you going to do? Quit. What? Not selling the gasoline. Not selling gasoline. Why would you? Every time you pump a gallon of gas into somebody's car, you're losing a quarter. Why would you do that? The only way to make you do that is to what? How can, I, how can government make you do that? Yeah, but pump gas. On the surface, hey, gas, $1.50 a gallon. But what's going to happen to our supply of gasoline? It's going to disappear. Gas will cost $1.50, but there's not going to be any to buy. That's why a conservative would say, leave government, all government does in an economy is screw it up. A liberal, kind of that group over here, generally believes that the free market must be regulated by government. In our case, it says, you know, we have to make sure that Estiv is not cheating, you know, people. That Estiv does not charge. You know, Estiv charges everybody the same price for his gasoline. Estiv makes sure that you know, that we regulate industry. A socialist believes industry must be owned by the government, and if it's owned by the government, then they can sell gasoline whatever price they want. They're the government. They sell it for $1.50 and it only it costs them $1.75 to buy it on the world market. Well, they'll lose a quarter every time they sell a gallon of gas. They may not be somewhere else. This is socialism. The gas company, the railroad company, the airplane company, the shipping company, the steel company, the oil company, are no longer owned by individuals, they are owned by the government. The idea is to make sure that everybody can afford as much gasoline as they want. The idea is to bring about equality 
less inequality, less unfairness. It's not fair that Estiv can afford a new BMW every other year, but Melissa is struggling to make the payments on her used Honda. This is not fair. How do we solve this problem? Take the car companies, put them under, under the ownership of government, and sell cars that everybody can afford no matter what. That's socialism. It's a scientific thing. We're going to talk a lot about this tomorrow, the, kind of the, the worship of science that starts to happen. The worship of reason. We can, a socialist believes that you can plan, that you can plan an economy better than the economy works on its own. That you can sit here and, and that a socialist believes that an economy can be planned as long as it's owned by government, planned by government, everybody will be economically equal. That's socialism. Socialism is the little brother of communism. Communism came first actually, before socialism. Socialism is kind of a less extreme form of communism. All power is centralized. There is no private property. Everything is owned by who? Government. We got a message. Yeah. Hey, uh, we got some extra flyers. Okay. We didn't hit the portables. Did hit the portables. Know? Okay, I'll get it to you. Hit them. Mm -hmm. I don't want any extra flyers, but them all up. Okay. Right. Everywhere. Communists say that if you bring about communism, you will have total equality for everyone. Communists are avowed atheists. The founder of communism, Karl Marx, famously said that religion is the opiate of the people, not opiate of drugs. Communists believe that their Theories stand up and follow science and reason, that you can reasonably and scientifically plan out an economy the same way you can reasonably and scientifically plan out you know, a science experiment. That all you need are the right planners. And who are the right planners? Government. They are the Congress. We are going to be using free market. The opposite of a free market is a command market. Communism is a command market. What does that mean? Command. Government tells people what to produce, how much to produce, how to produce it, and when to produce it. We don't have enough, you know, tractors. We have a plan to produce tractors for all the farmers who need them. That's communism. All the land is owned by the government. The government publishes this big, giant five-year plan. At the end of our five-year plan, we will have total and complete equality and happiness and prosperity for everyone. Why? Because science says so. This is communism. It is the complete opposite of a laissez-faire approach to economy. As a fair government stays out, lets the economy and the market do its thing, communism commands the market to do as it says. You will not sell bread for more than this, you will not sell cheese for more than that. You 
you know, tractors will be available there. It's a command economy. We are going to be using these terms I'm going to throw in there one last one, progressives. Progressives are a weird term. There are progressives who are kind of moderate liberals, progressives that are socialists, and progressives that you know run into communism too. We're going to see, you're, you'll see these terms in life, and you'll see these terms pretty much for the rest of the year in American history. We should have a pretty good handle on what a conservative thinks about the free market, what a conservative thinks about the size and scope and power of government. We should have a pretty good handle on what a liberal or a progressive thinks about the role of government, the role of government in the economy. This is a very, very important chart in all of its chartiness. Right? We should understand what socialism is, government control of industry. They'll treat the workers much better than the evil capitalists who oppress them. Communists take it a step further, say there should be no private property at all, equality for all. And if you stand in the way of equality, what are they going to do? Shoot you. Questions on this? So, the United States pretty much runs the top of um, conservatives and liberals. Yes, the United States. We have never. We have. We, we have. Our political economy. Our political culture has stuck pretty much here. I would say, kind of right around this land here around liberal with some conservative aspects, some socialist aspects. Certainly nothing over here. That's a good point that Ryan makes. Um, Any questions? Wait, what, yeah. what else did Karl Marx do other than communism? He, 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 he should do more? 